you ever wanted to make monthly cash flow from property, but don't feel you have enough capital? Or maybe you just don't know where to get started? Don't worry, I get it. In this video, you are going to see exactly how to start or scale your property journey without breaking the bank. Let's go. My name's Jordan. I'm Bradley's business partner. And today we're going to break down exactly what service accommodation is and how it works. So the best way I like to describe service accommodation is a hotel without staff. So it's where it's a short term let. So people are going to be staying anywhere from one night up to a maximum of a few months. If you're staying in a hotel, you are probably going downstairs to the restaurant to have dinner. You're, you're probably sort of living out the suitcase. Um, it's not a very homely feel. Whereas what we try to do with service accommodation is make it exactly that, a home away from home. So it's where people can go to a, go to a property, whether that's an apartment or a house, anywhere in the world. They can go there, they can stay, they can cook their dinner, they can sit in the lounge, watch TV, um, and it's a lot more of a comfortable place to be, especially if they're there for, as I say, a few months. Cool. So obviously when anyone's looking to get into property, um, there's normally some hurdles they come across, it, whether it be property in general or service accommodation specifically. Um, we've got a few examples on the slides. Do you want to just sort of talk them through and explain to people uh, what they mean? I think one of the things when people are trying to get involved in property is they are a bit scared and think they need some good savings, they need a uh, good credit, they need to build a deposit to buy a property. With what we do with service accommodation, that isn't really the case. Uh, another point here is talking about buy to let. Now, with all the interest rates and all the mortgage sort of um, costs increasing at the moment, a lot of these standard buy to lets that have maybe just got a family in, that's a, a standard rental property for a landlord, they're not making any money because the rent that they're charging doesn't cover the cost of that mortgage. So some months these landlords are actually out of pocket, whereas if they were looking to do the, the service accommodation model, it would probably be a lot better for them. Yeah. Um, so if you want to sort of talk through the top two. Sure. So, um, in terms of locations, what's great about service accommodation is that it, it works in a lot of different areas. Um, and the profits are a lot higher than the than the standard buy to let model. Um, in terms of, we've got a point here about being rejected or having difficulty with landlords um, and agents. The, the difficulty is, is because people are, are approaching landlords and agents more often saying the wrong thing than saying the right thing. It's actually more important you don't say the wrong thing as opposed to actually saying the right thing all the time. So a few phrases like not mentioning too much about Airbnb. Although that's what we're doing, it's that the platform has a lot of negative connotations with it. People talk about that. Accommodation is the property strategy. Airbnb is the platform where we advertise the property. So th th there's two parts. There's, there's buying a property to run as SA or to run as Airbnb. It's the same thing. Or there's renting a property from a landlord, paying a guaranteed rent every month, then you advertise in that property on Airbnb, also known as SA, and hopefully making a profit every month if you've done the research and if you set up the property correctly. So in that sense, there's massive savings as opposed to a lot of other property strategies. Sure. And just to give people an idea, in terms of um, getting started, what would you say on average in the UK is the sort of amount of capital you need to get started with a small SA unit, for example? Well, with, with a small SA unit, there's a few things to, to factor in. It's if you're doing rent to SA, so you're, you're renting off a landlord, you've got to bear in mind what the rent on that particular property is going to be, what the deposit is going to be, and there probably will be a holding deposit as well. And then you're going to have to furnish the property. So they're going to be your sort of three or four main costs in getting this done. Then when it's up and running, it's going to be your cost of just renting the property, paying the rent, paying the bills, um, and, a, and a, a few of the small charges. With the direct bookings, uh, would you say they're more for contractors or on the tourism side of things in general? Um, I would probably say a, a mixture of both because if you, if you look at the contractor market um, and we, we use Midland again for an example, yeah, by the way, this works all over the UK and as I say, all over the world, but I'm just using Midlands because it's just what I know so well. 
when you're dealing with the contractor market, you will often get repeat bookings and people coming back. So what we have in all of our apartments is a notice that says, if you'd like to rebook, this is our contact details, this is our email, this is our number, give us a call, let us know when you're coming to stay, and we can probably actually give you a little bit of a discount because we're not having them OTA fees, Airbnb and booking.com. So the, the contractors, we're really trying to push to get as many direct bookings as possible because it's a bit like a landlord knows a landlord, a contractor knows a contractor. So if we've got guys coming in um, and they're working on, let's say, for example, HS2 in the Midlands and they need somewhere to stay, they've probably got, they probably know other guys within HS2 that need somewhere to stay as well. So we're trying to get, well, you're just trying to make as many connections and network uh, as much as you can to try to get more people to come back. Now, having said that, with the tourism side of things, if you think about you go and book an Airbnb to go on a holiday with your family, and you want to go abroad, so you might want to go to Spain or Italy and you go book a place and you really like it and you want to go next year or a few years later, you'll you'll want to book again. But if there was an option there to book with that same host, the person that is running the Airbnb, and you can book directly and get a saving, obviously it's a, it's a big incentive for you to go back to that same place that you really liked. Again, Coventry-based, it's, I would probably say... Um, Probably 70 to 80 percent contractor, probably 20 to 30 percent tourism. Um, a lot of people are probably thinking, well, why does anyone want to go to Coventry? It's not a particularly nice place, um, but it's it's a very it's a big city. It has a lot going on. It's got two universities. It's got great links um, sort of around the Midlands and then around the rest of the UK. Um, it's got lots of industry. Um, we've, got, we've got Amazon, we've got JLR. HS2 is sort of everywhere, I, I agree, but the contractor market does really well there, um, and it's a small amount of tourism. But just slightly outside of Coventry, only 10 miles away in Leamington, my property's there, uh, probably 70, 80% tourism. And especially over here in Stratford Avon, which is 20 minutes down the road, we've got Shakespeare, um, we've got the river, we've got lots of different sort of um, bits of history happening here. A lot of people that come to Stratford are the tourism market. So I've, I've got a place in, in Stratford that's a one, two, three. It's a four bedroom house. It can sleep about eight to 11 people. And in the summer, we, we can charge anywhere from 300 to 500 pounds a night. Because if you've got eight yep. people staying in the centre of Stratford or eight people staying in the centre of Stratford in a hotel, they'd be paying minimum, minimum 800 pounds a night. The benefits of tourism over contractor. If your property is set up right, generally, you can charge more. If I, if I could show you some of my contractor properties as opposed to my tourism properties, you would see differences. The contractor properties are, are more basic, dressed well, and look nice, but more basic. And the tourism properties are a bit more higher end. But as I say, it costs a bit more to set up, but then you can charge a higher nightly rate. Cool. <laughs> Um, an example, as you say in commentary, just because it's an easy one to show. Um, so we've got expenses. We've got our rent at about eleven hundred quid. I pay eleven hundred quid for a for a three bed. Um, got about three hundred and seventy five of bills. So that's our council tax, our gas, water, and electric, and Wi Fi. So that comes to fourteen seventy five. Then we can charge about one hundred and fifty pound a night, over an average of about twenty three nights means you make about 3450 and then the 3450 minus our cost being our rent and our bills leaves you with a profit of just under two grand it might not look that exciting to some people it might look like a lot of money to some people you've got to bear in mind this is one five of these that's that's ten thousand pound a month that's five properties ten ten of these is twenty thousand pound a month that's a quarter of a million pound a year so what I'm trying to say is you can really quickly start to scale this up um, and then see some, some big returns coming in, hopefully month on month. One thing people need to understand is this is a business. You have to be very focused, be doing research, having conversations, and ultimately you need a business set up to do that. I would also recommend my accountant as well. 
purely because when I started, I didn't really know what I was doing in, in any of it, to be honest. Um, I sort of picked it up and learned it as I went along. But what they did was, was um, they didn't need to do this, and not a lot of accountants would. I went in there and I had a conversation with them, and they explained how things work with the company set up, with the taxes, with um, paying me, dividends, loans, director's loans, VAT, everything like that. And I looked at them, just gone out. Like, I don't know what you're on. Transferred on to zero and different softwares for accountancy. But a few years ago, it was receipts and everything. Every time you come in to see us, Bradley, we'll sit down, we'll explain it to you. They didn't need to do that. They could just go, like, send us this, do this, do that, do this. And what I like about these guys is they're property guys as well. So they get it. And they, they, they like property. They like what I'm doing with, with my businesses and with the service combination side of things. So they're great to deal with. So in terms of where to source, you're going to have, as, as we've mentioned, you've got two different approaches. You've got an estate agent over here and you've got direct to a landlord over here. And then the next one is obviously, as we've mentioned, there's, there's two ways of getting the properties with estate agents and landlords. Um, we did touch on this earlier in terms of knowing what not to say. But if you just want to sort of go over the, the, the few points here that we've got uh, and sort of explain those. Yeah. So in terms of breadth of the viewing, it's just, um, it, as I say, and forgive me if this sounds a bit of an unfair thing to say, maybe it's because I've done it for a few years, but it, it's common sense. It's it's being polite to people. It's turning up on time. It's being relatively smartly dressed, but not over the top. It's having the branding if you can. Um, you've understood about the property because you, you, you've made the phone call in the first place. You, you've done your research. You know the size. You've had a probably a quick look um, of what else is on the market to understand if the market that the rent they're looking to charge you is fair. Um, and then, then, then go look around the property and, and, and see what you think. Knowing who's best to talk to, uh, I guess you don't want to be dealing with uh, an admin person that isn't really a decision maker. But at the start, you're not going to have too much of a choice. Whoever's showing you around the property is whoever's showing you around the property. You're not going to have control over that. You just have to make sure that when you put your offer forward, it goes to the right person. What we mean by that is an approach with an agent. When you're approaching the agent, you're explaining that they're very much still involved in the whole process. So if they're managing the property, they're still getting their management fee every month. They can still do their inspections every six months or 12 months. They're involved. When you're approaching the landlord, you're taking everything away from them to make it easy. You're doing all the cleans. You're doing all the management. You're doing a lot of the maintenance. Their life are going to have no issues. You're guaranteeing rent. So that's what we mean when we say two different approaches. Do you want to sort of go over each of the points here and actually explain why they are so important that you get them right? So when, when, when you're furnishing a property, um, you've got to bear in mind who your guest is going to be. So who is your guest? Is it going to be contractor market or tourism market? Um, what level of tourism? Is it going to be staying at the seaside or um, in an apartment? Or is it going to be staying in a, a nice, big, fancy, expensive home? So the way you furnish it, you furnish it to match who the guest is going to be. You don't just sort of furnish it um, with, with sofas and beds and then go, oh, actually, I I'm going to have a contract to stay in there, but I'm also going to have um, tourists and a family charging a high nightly rate staying there. So you yeah. need to know your guest before you can actually furnish the property. And what you're trying to do is you're just trying to make it as much of a home away from home as possible, regardless of who your guest is going to be. So you're going to go ahead on to photography on that side of things. Photography, again, is a bit like if you're selling a property, when you're scrolling through Rightmove, you want something that stands out. So in employing professional photographers to come and do a great job so that property looks fantastic will we'll, we'll pay in the long run. And obviously, when setting up your Airbnb business, there's, there's two ways. You can either employ a management company or you can either do it yourself or hire staff yourself. Um, you opt to employ a management company. Um, as we've yeah. already mentioned, I know. Do you want to sort of explain, uh, again, just sort of why that is, just to refresh people, and the sort of things that you look for when selecting a good management company and the sort of things to avoid? Sure. So it's what I'm saying and being sort of completely open and honest is this is the fourth management company I've dealt with, um, and they are by far the best. 
I won't sort of name and shame management companies. They were they were the previous ones were good and bad for different reasons. Um, one of the biggest things was one of the companies that wasn't so good was just far too big. They looked after thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of properties. I think something around thirty five thousand all over um, the world. And so the retention to detail to deal with my properties and actually communicate with me any issues or anything that needed changing was very poor. 